Section 8 of The Black Dog and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Dog and Other Stories by A. E. Coppert. The Man from Kilsheelan. If you knew the man from Kilsheelan, it was no use saying you did not believe in fairies and secret powers. Believe it or no, but believe it you should. There he was. It is true he was in an asylum for the insane, but he was a man with age upon him, so he didn't mind. And besides, better men than himself have been in such places, or they ought to be, and if there is justice in the world, they will be. A cousin of mine, he said to old Tom Toole one night, is come from America, a rich person. He lay in the bed next to him. But Tom Tool didn't answer, so he went on again. In a ship, he said. I hear you, answered Tom Tool. I see his mother with her bosom open once, and it's stuffed with diamonds, bags full. Tom Tool kept quiet. If, said the man from Kilsheelan, if I had the trusty comrade, I'd make a break from this and go see him. Was he asking you to do that? How could he, and all in he in a ship? Was he right and find letters to you then? How could he, under the Lord? Would he give them to a savage bird or a herring to bring to me so? How did he let on to you? He did not let on, said the man from Kilsheelan. Tom Tool lay long silent in the darkness. He had a mistrust of the man, knowing him to have a forgetful mind. Everything slipped through it like rain through the nest of a pigeon. But at last he asked him, Where is he now? He'll be at Ballygoving. You to know that, and you with no word from him. Oh, I know it, I know. And if I'd a trusty comrade, I'd walk out of this, and to him I would go. Bags of diamonds. Then he went to sleep sudden. But the next night he was at Tom Tool again. If I'd a trusty comrade, said he, and all that and a lot more. It is not convenient to me now, said Tom Tool. But tomorrow night I might go with you. The next night was a wild night, and a dark night, and he would not go to make a break from the asylum. He said, Fifty miles of journey, and I with no heart for great walking feats. It is not convenient, but tomorrow I might go with you. The night after that, he said, I wish we'd be your diamonds and all. Why would you go from the place that is snug and warm into a world that is like a wall for cold dark, and but the thread of a coat to divide you from its mighty clasp? And only one thing blacker under the heaven of God, and that's the road you walk on. And only one thing more shy than your heart, and that's your two feet worn to a tissue tramping in dung and ditches. If I'd a trusty comrade, said the man from Kilsheelan, I'd go seek my rich cousin. Stars gaping at you a few spans away, and the things that have life in them, if I cannot see or speak, begin to breathe and bend. If ever your hair stood up on it, it is then it would be. Though you'd know more than would thatch a thimble. God help you. Bags of gold he has, continued the man, and his pockets stuffed with tobacco. Tobacco? There are large pockets and well stuffed. Do you say now? And the gold, large bags and rich bags. Well, I might do it tomorrow. And the next day, Tom Toole and the man from Kilsheelan broke from the asylum and crossed the mountains and went on. For four little nights and four long days they were walking. Slow it was, for they were oldish men, and lost they were. But the journey was kind, and the weather was good weather. On the fourth day Tom Toole said to him, The deer knows what a way you be taking me. Blind it seems, and dazed I am. I could do with a skillet a good soup to steady me, and to soothe me. Hard it is, and hungry it is, sighed the man. Starved after my for a taste of nourishment. A blind man's dog would pity me. If I, if I see a cat, I'll eat it. I could bite the nose off a duck. They did not converse any more for a time. Not until Tom Toole asked him what was the name of his grand cousin. And then the man from Kilsheelan was in a bedazement, and he was confused. I declare on me so. I forgot his little name. Wait now while I think of it. Was it McKearney then? No, not it at all. Havana? 
The Gorgons? Or the Duffies? Wait, wait, while I think of it now. Tom Tool waited. He waited and all until he thought he would burst. Ah, uh, what's astray with you? Was it Felon? Or O'Hara? Or Clancy? Or Peter Mew? No, no, I'll it at all. The Murphys, the Sweeneys, the Moors. Devil the one, wait while I think of it now. And the man from Kilsheenland sat holding his face as if it hurt him. And his comrade kept saying to him, Do ye then, Coman, McGrath? And driving him distracted with his oh this and oh that, his McHees and McShees. Well, he could not think of it. But when they walked on, they had not far to go. For they came over a twist of the hills, and there was the ocean, and the neat little town of Ballygubbin in a bay of it below, with the wreck of a ship lying sunk near the strand. There was a sharp cliff at either horn of the bay, and between them some bullocks straying on the beach. Truth is a fortune, cried the man from Kilsheelan. This is it. They went down the hill to the strand near the wreck, and just on the wing of the town they saw a paddock full of hemp stretched drying, and a house near it and a man weaving a rope. He had a great cast of hemp around his loins and a green apron. He walked backwards to the sea, and a young girl stood turning a little wheel as he went away from her. "'God save you,' said Tom Tool to her. "'For who are you weaving this rope?' "'For none but God and the hangman,' said she. Turning the wheel she was, and the man going away from it backwards, and the dead wreck in the rocky bay." A fine, sweet girl, of good dispose, and no ways drifty. Long life to you, then, young woman, says he. But that's a strong word, and a sour word. The Lord spare us all. At that, the rope walker let a shout to her to stop the wheel. Then he cut the rope at the end and tied it to a black post. After that, he came throwing off his green apron and said he was hungry. Dennis, Avik, cried the girl. Come and I'll get you food. And the two of them went away into the house. Brother and sister they are, said the man from Kilsheelan. A good appetite to them. Very neat she is, and clean she is, and a good and sweet and tidy she is, said Tom Tool. They stood in the yard watching some white fowls parading and feeding and conversing in the grass. Scratch, peck, peck, ruffle, quarrel, scratch, peck, peck, cock-a-doodle-doo. What we do now, Tom Tool? My belly has a scroop and a screech in it. I could eat the full of Isnagany Lake and grape for more, or the hill of Bon and not get to my enough. Beyond them was the paddock with the hemp drying across it, long heavy strands and two big stacks of it beside, dark and sodden, like seaweed. The girl came to the door and called, Will you take a bite? Then they said they would, and that she should eat with spoons of gold in the heaven of God and Mary. You're welcome, she said, but no more, she said, for while they ate she was sad and silent. The young man Dennis led on that their father, one Horan, was away on his journeys peddling a load of ropes. A long journey, days had he been gone, and he might be back today, or tomorrow, or the day after. A great stew of hemp you have, said the man from Kilsheelan. The young man cast down his eyes, and the young girl cried out, "'Tis foul hemp, God preserve us all. Do you tell me of that now? he asked, but she would not, and her brother said, I will tell you. It is a great misfortune, Mr. Man. Tis from the wreck in the bay beyond, a good stout ship, but burst on the rocks one dark terror of a night, and all the poor sailors tipped in the sea. But the tide was low and they got ashore, ten strong sailor men, with a bird in a cage that was dead drowned. The dear rested soul, said Tom Toole. There was no rest in the ocean for a week. The bay was full of storms, and the vessel burst, and the big bale split, and the hemp was scattered and torn and tangled on the rocks, or it did drift. But at last it soothed, and we gathered it and brought it to the field here. We brought it, and my father did buy it of the salvage man for a price. A Mexican valuer he was. But the deal was very bad, and it lies there, going rotten it is. The rain wears it, and the sun is astray, and the wind is gone. That's a great misfortune. What is on it? said the man from Kilsheelan. It is a great misfortune, Mr. Mann. Laid out it is, turned it is, hackled it is, but faith it will not dry or sweeten, never a hank of it worth a pig's eye. Tis the devil and all his injury, said Kilsheelan. The young girl, her name was Christine, sat grieving. 
One of her beautiful long hands rested on her knee, and she kept beating it with the other. Then she began to speak. The captain of that ship lodged in this house with us while the hemp was recovered and sold. A fine handsome sport he was, but fond of the drink, and very friendly with the Mexican man. Very hearty they were. A great greasy man with his hands covered with rings that you'd not believe. Covered! My father had been gone traveling a week or a few days when a dark raging gale came off the bay one night till the hemp was lifted all over the field. It would have lifted a bullock, said Dennis. Great lumps of it, like trees. And we sat waiting the captain, but he didn't come home and we went sleeping. But in the morning the Mexican man was found dead murdered on the strand below. Struck in a skull, and the two hands of him gone. It was not long when they came to this house and said he was last seen with the captain, drunk quarreling. And where was he? I said to them that he hadn't come home at all and was away from it. We'll take a peep at his bed, they said, and I brought them there, and my heart gave a strong twist in me when I see the captain stretched on it, snoring to the world and his face and hands smeared with the blood. So he was brought away and searched, and in his pocket they found one of the poor Mexican's hands, just one, but none of the riches. Everything to be so black against him, and the assizes just coming on in Cork. So they took him there before the judge, and he judged him and said it's to hang he was. And if they asked the captain how he did it, he said he did not do it at all. But there was a bit of iron pipe beside the body, said Dennis. And if they asked him where was the other hand, the one with the rings and the mighty jewels on them, and his budget of riches. He said he knew nothing of that, nor how the one hand got into his pocket. Place there it was by some schemer. It was all he could say, for the drink was on him and nothing he knew. You'd be so drunk, they said. How did you get home to your bed and nothing heard? I don't know, says he. God's sakes, the poor lamb, a gallant strong sailor he was. His mind was blank, he said. Tis blank, said the judge. If it's as blank as the head of himself with a cap like that in it, go and rest him. He could have put a pound of cheese in it, said Dennis. And Peter Cochorin cried like a loony man, for his courage was gone like a stream of water. To hang him, the judge said, and to hang him well, was their intention. It was a pity, the judge said, to rob a man because he was foreign, and destroy him for riches and the drink on him. And Peter Cochorin swore he was innocent of this crime. Put a clean shirt on me back, says he, for it's to heaven I'm going. And, said Dennis, the peeler at the door said, Amen. That was a week ago, said Christine, and in another he'll be stretched, a handsome sporting sailor boy. What, what did you say was the name of him? gasped the man from Kilsheelan. Peter Cochorin, the poor lamb. Be God, he cried out as if he was joking, tis me grand cousin from Ameriky. True it was, and the grief on him so great that Dennis was after giving the two of them a lodge till the execution was over. Rest here, me dad's away, said he, and he knowing nothing of the murder, or the robbery, or this hanging that's coming, nothing. Ah, what will we tell him in all? Tis a black story on this house. The blessings of God and Mary on you, said Tom Toole. Maybe we could do a hand's turn for you. Me comrade's a great wonder with the miracles. Maybe he could do a stroke with free in an instant van. Is it joking you are? asked Christine sternly. God deliver him, how could I joke on a man going to his doom and destruction? The next day the young girl gave them jobs to do, but the man from Kilsheelan was destroyed with trouble, and he shook like water when a pan of it is struck. What is on you? said Tom Toole. Vexed and waxy I am, says he. In regard of the great journeys we took, and sort of a help at the end of it. Why couldn't he do his bloody murder after we had done with him? Maybe he didn't do it at all. Ah, oh, what are you saying now, Tom Toole? Wouldn't anyone do it? A nice, easy, innocent crime. The cranky gossoon to get himself stretched on the head of it. Says the drink destroyed him. Sure's there's no more justice in the world than you'd find in the craw of a sick pullet. Vexed and waxy I am for me careless cousin. Do it. Who wouldn't do it? He went up to the rope that Dennis and Christine were weaving together, and he put his fingers on it. Is that the rope, says he, that'll hang my grand cousin? No, said Dennis. It is not. His rope came through to the post office yesterday. 
For the prison master it was, a long new rope, saints preserve us, and Jimmy Fallon the postman getting roaring drunk showing it to the scores of creatures would give him a drink for the sight of it. Just coiled it was, and no way hidden, with a label on it, O-H-M-S. The wind's rising you, said Christine. Take a couple of forks now and turn the hemp in the field. Maybe it will scour the Satan out of it. Stormy it does be, and the bay is darkened in broad noon, said Tom Toole. Why wouldn't the whole world be dark and a man to be hung, said she. They went to the hemp so knotted and stinking, and began raking it and raking it. The wind was roaring from the bay, the hulk twitching and tottering. The gulls came off the wave, and Christine's clothes stretched out from her like the wings of a bird. The hemp heaved upon the paddock like a great beast bursting a snare that was on it, and a strong blast drove a heap of it upon the man from Kilsheelan, twisting and binding him in its clasp till he thought he would not escape from it, and he went falling and yelping. Tom Toole unwound him, and sat him in the loo of the stack till he got his strength again, and then he began to moan of his misfortune. Said Tom Toole, isn't it as hard to cure it as a wart on the back of a hedgehog? But he wouldn't stint it. Tis large and splendid talk I get from you, Tom Toole, but divil a deed of strength. Vexed and waxy I am. Why couldn't he do his murder after we'd done with him? What a cranky cousin, what a foolish creature, what a silly man the devil take him. Let you be easy, the other said. To heaven he is going. And what's the gain of it, if he to go with his neck stretched? Indeed, I did know a man went to heaven once, began Tom Toole, but he did not care for it. That's queer, said the man, for there couldn't be anything you'd not want, indeed to glory. Well, he came back to Ireland on the head of it. I forget what was his name. Was it Corcoran, or Toole, or Horan? No, none of those names. He led on it was a lonely place, not fit for living people or dead people, he said. Nothing but trees and streams and beasts and birds. What beasts and birds? Rabbits and badgers, elephants, the dromedary, all those ancient races, eagles and hawks and cuckoos and magpies. He wandered in a thick forest for nights and days, like a flea and a great beard, and the beasts and the birds setting traps and hooks and dangers for the poor feller. The worst villains of all was the sheep. The sheep? What could a sheep do then? asked Elshelan. I don't know the right of it, but you'd not believe me if I told you it all. If you went for a little swim, you was not seen again. I never heard the like of that in Roscommon. Not another holy soul was in it but himself, and if he was taken with the thirst, he would dip his hands in a stream that flowed with rich wine and put it to his lips. But if he did, it turned to air at once and twisted up in a blue cloud. But Grandwine to look at, he said, If he took oranges from a tree, he could not bite them. They were chiny oranges, hard as plate. But beautiful oranges to look at they were. To pick a flower, it burst on you like a gun. What was cold was too cold to touch, and what was warm was too warm to swallow. You must throw it up or die. Faith is no reason for a Christian soul, Tom Toole. Where is it at all? Oh, high it may be, low it may be. It may be here, it may be there. What could the like of a sheep do? A sheep? A devouring savage creature it is there. The most hard to come at, the most difficult to conquer. With the teeth of a lion and a tiger, the strength of a bear and a half, the deceit of two foxes, the run of a deer, the... Is it heaven you call it? I'd not look twice at a place the like of that. No, you would not, no. Ah, but wait now, said Kilsheelan. Wait till the day of judgment. Well, I will not wait then, said Tom Toole sternly. When the sinners of the world are called to their judgment, scatter they will all over the face of the earth, running like hares till they come to the sea, and there they will perish. Ah, the love of God on the world. They went raking and raking, till they came to a great stiff hump of it that rolled over, and they could say sticking from the end of it two boots. Oh, what is it in the name of God? Sorry, no, but I'd not like to look, said Tom Toole. And they called the girl to come see what it was. A dead man, said Christine, in a thin voice with great tremble coming on her. And she, what is a tooth? Unwind him now. 
they began to unwind him like a tailor with a bale of tweed. And at last they came to a man black in the face. Strangled he was. The girl let a great cry out of her. Queen of heaven, tis my dad. Choked he is, the long strands have choked him, my good pleasant dad. And she went with a run to the house crying. What has he there in his hand? asked Kilshelan. Tis a chopper, says he. Do you see what is on it, Tom Tool? Sure I see, and you see what is on it. Blood is on it, and murder is on it. Go fetch a peeler. I'll wait while you bring him. When his friend was gone for the police, Tom Toole took a little squint around him and slid his hand into the dead man's pocket. But if he did, he was nearly struck mad from his senses, for he pulled out a loose dead hand that had been chopped off as neat as the foot of a pig. He looked at the dead man's arms, and there was a hand to each. So he looked at the hand again. The fingers were covered with the rings of gold and diamonds. Covered! Glory be to God, said Tom Toole and he put his hand in another pocket and fetched a budget full of papers and banknotes. Glory be to God, he said again, and put the hand and the budget back in the pockets, and turned his back, and said prayers until the peelers came and took them all off to the court. It was not long, two days or three, until an inquiry was held. Grand it was, and its judgment was good, and the big wig asked, Where is the man that found the body? There are two of them, says the peeler. Swear em says he, and Kilshelan stepped up to a great murdering joker of a clerk, who gave him a book in his hand and roared at him, I swear by almighty God. Yes, said Kilshelan. Swear it, says the clerk. Indeed I do. You must repeat it, says the clerk. I will, sir. Well, repeat it then, says he. And what will I repeat? So he told him again, and he repeated it. And then the clerk goes on, that the evidence I give... Yes, says Kilshelan. Say those words, if you please. The words? Oh, give me the head of them again. So he told him again, and he repeated it. Then the clerk goes on. Shall be the truth. It will, says Kilshelan. And nothing but the truth. Yes, be God indeed. Say nothing but the truth, roared the clerk. No, says Kilshelan. Say nothing. All right, says Kilshelan. Can't you say nothing but the truth? Yes, he says. Well, say it. I will so, he says he. The scrapings of sense on it all. So they swore them both, and their evidence they gave. Very good, his lordship said. A most important and opportune discovery in the nick of time by the tracing of God. There is a reward of fifty pounds offered for the finding of this property and jewels. Fifty pounds you will get in due course. They said they were obliged to him though sorrow one of them knew what he meant by a due course, nor where it was. Then a lawyer man guided the rights of the whole case. He was the cunningest man ever lived in the city of Cork. No one could match him, and he made it straight, and he made it clear. Old Horan must have returned from his journey unbeknown on the night of the gale when the deed was done. Perhaps he had made a poor profit in his toil, for there was little of his own coin found on his body. He saw the two drunks staggering along the bay, he clove in the head of the one with a bit of pipe. He hit the other a good whack to still or stiffen him. He got an axe from the yard. He shore off the Mexican's two hands, for the rings were grown tight and wouldn't be drawn from his fat fingers. Perhaps he dragged the captain home to his bed. You couldn't be sure of that. But put the hand in the captain's pocket he did, and went to the paddock to bury the treasure. But a blast of wind whipped and wove some of the hemp strand around his limbs, binding him sudden. He was all huffled and hoggled and went mad with fear, struggling, the hemp rolling him and binding him till he was strangled or smothered. And that is what happened to him, believe it or no. But believe it, you should. It was the tracing of God on him for his dark crime. Within a week of it, Peter Kokorin was away out of the gull, a stout walking man again, free and belly gubbing. But on the day of his release, he did not go near the rope walker's house. The Horans were there waiting, and the two old silly men, but he did not go next or near them. The next day Kilshelan said to her, Strange it is my cousin not to seek you, and he a sneezer for gallantry. Tis no wonder at all, replied Christine, and he with his picture in all the papers. But he had a right to have come now, and you carrying him in his black misfortune, said Tom Toole. Well, he will not come then, said Christine in her soft voice, in regard of the red murder on the soul of my dad. 
And why should he put a mark on his family, and he the captain of a ship? In the afternoon, Tom Toole and the other went walking to try if they should see him, and they did see him at a hotel, but he was hurrying from it. He had a freeze coat on him and a bag in his hand. Well, who are you at all? asked Peter Corcordon. You are my cousin from America, said Kilsheelan. Is that so? And I never heard it, says Peter. What's your name? The man from Kilsheelan hung down his old head and couldn't answer him, but Tom Toole said, Thrifty he is, sir. He forgets his little name. Astray, is he? My mother said I've cousins in Roscommon. Do you know him? The Twingenings? Twingening! Oh, and Twingening it is, roared Kilsheelan. "'Tis my name, tis my name, tis my name!" And he danced about squawking like a parrot in a frenzy. "'If it's Owen Twingening you are, I'll bring you to my mother in Manhattan.' The captain grabbed up his bag. "'Haste now, come along out of it. I'm going from the cunning town this minute. Bad sleep to it forever in a month. There's a cart waiting to catch me the boat train to Queenstown. Will you go? Now?' "'Holy God, contrive it!' said Kilsheelan. His voice was wheezy as an old goat, and he made to go off with him. Good day to you, Tom Tool. You'll get all the reward and endure a rich life from this out. Fortune on it all, a fortune on it all. And the two of them were gone in a twink. Tom Tool went back to the horns then. Night was beginning to dusk and to darken. As he went up the rope walk, Christine came to him from her potato gardens and gave him signs. He to be quiet and follow her down to the strand. So he followed her down to the strand and told her all that happened, till she was vexed and full of tender words for the old fool. Aren't you the spirit of misfortune? It would daunt a saint, so it would, and scrape a tear from silky Satan's eye. Those two deluders, they've but the drainings of half a heart between them, and he not willing to lift the feather of a thought on me. I'd not forget him till there's ten days in a week and every one of them lucky. But... But isn't Peter Corcoran the nice name for a captain man? The very pattern. She gave him a little bundle into his hand. There's a loaf and a cut of meat. You'd best be starting from here. Yes, he said, and stood looking stupid, for his mind was in a dream. The rock at one horn of the bay had a red glow on it like the shawl on the neck of a lady, but the other was black now. A man was dragging a turf boat up the beach. Listen you, said Christine. There's two upstart men in the house now, seeking you and the other. There's trouble and damage on the head of it. From the asylum they are, to the police they have been, to put an embargo on the reward, and Sarah a sixpence ill receive of the fifty pounds of it. To the expense of the asylum it must go, they say. The treachery. Devil and all, the blood sweating on every coin of it will rot the palm of a nigger. Do you hear me at all? She gave him a little shaking, for he was standing stupid gazing at the bay which was dying into grave darkness except for the wash of its broken waves. Do you hear me at all? It's quit now you should, my little old man, or they'll be taking you. Ah, yes, sir. I hear you, Christine. Thank you kindly. Just looking and listening, I was. I'll be stirring from it now, and I'll get on and I'll go. Just looking and listening, I was. Just a wee look. Then goodbye to you, Mr. Tom Toole, said Christine Horan, and turning from him, she left him in the darkness and went running up the rope walk to her home. End of section 8